turn that noise up against the whole reactionary political agenda taking over this country from the Howard Beach style racist attack to the rock and roll censorship to the televangelist assault on abortion clinics. We say no. Basta ya. Enough. Resist Michael Rose, Muta Baruka, DOA, Gil Scott Heron, Pablo Moses, Carmej Dion Farris, Allen Ginsberg, John Trudell, MC Life, Order 2, Shelley Thunder, Aini Kamosi, I can see, and many more. I can see, and many more. Michael Rose, Muta Baruka, DOA, Gil Scott Heron, Pablo Moses, Carmej Dion Farris, Allen Ginsberg, John Trudell, MC Life, Order 2, Shelley Thunder, Aini Kamosi, I can see, and many more. I can see, and many more. podcast slash blog of what's going on in the world around me, Jeff Cliff. Uh, this is for June 2nd, 2019. We are halfway through 2019, almost to 2020. It's unbelievable. Uh, I didn't even imagine being alive at this point, but I guess here we are. So uh, this is a uh, alternative to your Netflix, your MPAA, your RIA, your movie theaters, your commercial radio stations like Clear Channel stations and other related media monopoly interests. And this is available, this broadcast is available on YouTube or NSA Alphabet YouTube, uh, NSA Facebook, Mega, and BitChute uh, when BitChute decides to process my videos. And we are working on Twitch. Which might come in the future. But anyway, this is as other episodes. Uh, I have some Creative Commons music. And this one is from a defunct band. I've been looking for information on it. There is nothing online. They have like a Twitter account that they posted one tweet on like in 2011. Uh, but it's, it sounds like it's just some little garage uh, alternative band uh, by the name of Iron Stain or Iron Steen something along those lines. But it is a Creative Commons song, and so let's give it a listen and go from there.
Feel the freedom oozing from your ears after that song. That is definitely a libertarian bent uh, band, uh, possibly a little on the end cap side with Don't Tread on Me. Now, once again, Iron Stain. Um, and just as a side note, that little clip you heard at the beginning of the show, that kind of little reggae thing, that was one Lister from WUSB Radio, one of the main sources for reggae in North America. Uh, advertising for a concert that has long since gone away, remixed a little bit uh, to make it kind of keep the beat a little. But as usual, that song, I, I, I think that song would have been like, it would have fit right, that, that Iron Stain song would have fit right in the basement in uh, Saskatoon. And that kind of whole uh, scene there, I could definitely see jumping in a mosh pit or something uh, to that one. But... As usual, there's a couple of things kind of going on this week, it's kind of mentioning and talking about. The first one, I was going to take the, the audio out to kind of clip. I've been listening to a lot of uh, Brain Damage, which was a show on WUSB in New York uh, back in the 1980s. And this show uh, specifically made kind of the point, I, I think the context was, the uh, Shore Nuclear uh, Power Plant, which at the time was still being built, they wound up canceling the thing, for better or worse, in New York. And uh, they, they kind of made the point that the, quote, we're here to worry, unquote, quote, unquote. And that, that kind of struck me as kind of an important point, uh, which is that 
the radio station that w was worrying a lot about it, and they were organizing against it, and they were part of the, the kind of broader anti-nuclear power and nuclear weapons movements uh, at the time, which was starting to get pretty big. I think they mentioned there was a protest. It was like the largest protest in New York State since 1982 or 1980, something on that line, happened in, in around that week uh, against the use of nuclear weapons or the development of nuclear weapons because there were some big peace negotiations happening at the time between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the Soviet Union was basically capitulating and giving them all kinds of guarantees about the reductions of nuclear weapons and the, the the, I, I, again, I didn't follow it deep enough to know exactly which treaty this was. It may have been SALT, it may have been something else. It, it may have been one of the ones that Trump and Putin have kind of ripped up by now. Uh, but it was interesting at the time to, to kind of see the world powers at least trying to get a handle on the doomsday machines that they had built. But nevertheless, they were worried about it. And the radio station in particular, uh, the, the kind of voice of the people that they were, uh, or tried to be, or aspired to be, uh, had this 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 concept that they had to be that place where where he came from that someone has to be the voice that says hey should we be paying attention to this this threat now as far as nuclear power goes I'm personally not necessarily even against it there there's a time and a place for critical analysis and challenging of ideas and broadcast media is part of where that space could be. And the internet, of course, allows anyone to be that broadcast media. That's kind of the, the goal of this show, is to be broadcast on as many platforms as humanly possible. And so the... Okay, so anyway, the, the, the point here is that this, this, the goal of this show, as mentioned in kind of the first episode, uh, was to, to continue this, the, the, the flame of Rant Radio. And one of the things that they did, and I really didn't see it, as clearly until this week, was to provide an avenue for our fears to be expressed and to be seen and heard by other people and to be then put up in a way that allows us to see and at least uh, note down that there are these things out there to be afraid of. Now, obviously, media does a pretty good job of this, generally, uh, and this this show is not unique in that whatsoever. If you want a really good example of how this sort of thing works, uh, you can look at Fox News and Infowars. They both kind of work the same on this level uh, in terms of picking out something that we could be afraid of. Oh, no, the, the Mexicans are coming, or the, the, the you know, the, the doomsday machines could be exploding, or... You know, Iraq could have weapons of mass destruction, right? There's lots of things we could be afraid of. But at the same time, there is a need for somebody to have the fear, for somebody to have the, the, the bad case scenarios being talked about or at least noted down or, or, or brought up occasionally. Uh, Adam Curtis's The Trap makes a pretty good point that the people with kind of the darkest nightmares, uh, there's a means for them to, to leverage those nightmares to gain political power and to, uh, for those bad case scenarios to transform one's kind of mediocre political agenda into something that can actually move people and to bring people into a situation where they'll give you the authority to act. And there's good and bad in that. On one hand, if you use that power wisely and to... And if you act in ways or organize people to act in ways that remove that fear, then things can be avoided. Bad case scenarios can be addressed. The ozone hole in the 1980s, people freaked out about it. Why did people freak out about it? Because there was media out there that wasn't censored enough on at least environmental issues that you could get away with talking about it and talking about what you could do to address it. And at least the experts work together on an international level and solve the problem. Now, it's not permanently solved. Just this past couple of weeks uh, in China, there was a factory discovered, or two factories, I think, that were discovered that are releasing massive amounts of ozone hole creating hydrofluorocarbons or, so, or something along those lines that is doing damage to the ozone in a big way. Now, 
that is addressable. That's two points of failure uh, that are failing right now. We can fix that. China can fix that. If it's an, an issue, a bad enough issue, and it probably is, uh, governments around the world can work with China to solve that problem. It's it's very solvable at this point. It's it's not out of control at all. Compare and contrast with climate change. Climate change is not in control. We're not anywhere close to solving either the political problem or the 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 engineering problems involved. Where it's just totally out of control at this. Point. But again, I'm I'm kind of getting a little sidetracked here. the The basic point though is that there is a need in the world for us to have a place we can go to at least be aware of things that could go wrong in our lives. And it's possible that we can just fall off the cliff entirely. That something like InfoWars, that you can just keep going down that, that paranoia rabbit hole and just keep getting deeper and deeper into imagined conspiracies and imagined things that can go wrong. And there is a danger in that. But as long as we're wary of that danger and wary of our limits of what we can and cannot do, both as individuals as in groups, it's still worth pursuing them, at least on some media, somewhere. And as long as I'm <laughs> the one making this show, um, and you know, I, I'd, I'd love, love to see other people, people doing this. this. And I'd love to, to be able to just hand off something like the ideas of what I want to see from this show to someone else and just stop doing the show. But so far, I don't see anyone doing it, at least not in the way I'd like it anyway. So continuing on, the other thing that kind of came up this week is kind of surrounds one of the YouTube shows that it, it, it's like on YouTube Red. So don't subscribe to YouTube Red. It's a really bad idea to, to even hook up your payment network or payment system to Google to feed that Prism participant. But the particular YouTube uh, show, and it, the name is slipping me, but it's not all that important. The basic idea was that they are going and re-looking at some of the kind of important findings in the world of psychology and neuroscience over the past you know, 30, 40 years. And they've done stuff like recreate a, a similar experiment to the Stanford Prison Experiment, uh, which is kind of the definition of why we have ethics committees and why, <laughs> why we can't just have mad scientists creating experiments and running them themselves with their own funding or from funding from universities without anyone taking the second or two of thinking, hmm, how will this affect the people that we're doing experiments on? Does this experiment violate the kind of conventions of what is humane badly enough that we would have hung the person responsible in the Nuremberg trials, that sort of thing, right? But no, they've, they've actually reproduced some of these experiments and they've done it in a relatively humane way to get some of the ideas tested. And some, some of the ideas were verifiable and some of them weren't. And it's, it, it is interesting to, to kind of go through it. But the, the point isn't the particular experiments. The point is the one of the experiments that was done was the trolley problem. And the, the, the basic problem is you have a, a, a kind of a, a train track and you have the train coming down the track and you're unable to stop the train, but you see on one side of the tracks ahead, there's five people and the train is going to hit five people unless you do something and there just happens to be a switch that you can throw to move the train from one track to another. And uh, on that other track, there's one person. So if you flip the switch, you're murdering one person. If you don't flip the switch, you're by your inaction, you're effectively killing five people. And the, the particular YouTube episode did it as kind of a test of what do human beings actually do in that situation. But you could just as easily imagine it as a what human beings should do. And that, that's kind of what I would want to get at here. In that there are situations that come up where you don't know what you're going to do until you're in the situation. And the situation is a stressful situation where you don't have a lot of time to think. You don't have a lot of time to react. You don't have a lot of time to debate. You have to act. And in those situations, it is handy to have practiced a little bit beforehand of what to do in that situation. Now for the trolley problem, we can get into what you should and shouldn't do. That's not really all that important here. The important part is that the trolley problem is kind of a basic building block for a lot of more complicated ethical problems and ethical situations. I've come up with a few of them myself. There's a Facebook group dedicated to them that's actually really interesting, uh, given <laughs> that they do it with like basically stick figures and 
you know, black and white MS Paint drawings, but they come up with some pretty profound stuff sometimes. And it's, it's, it's worth a look every once in a while, at least. And they just, it forces you to, to take complex ideas from academic philosophy and moral philosophy and actually implement them in a way that normal people can understand and go, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that then. But the trolley problem isn't the only situation where this sort of thing happens. Uh, first aid's another. A lot of what you learn in first aid courses is that you have to act. And there are some simple things that you have to do, uh, but you have to do them and you have to do them on, with enough with enough forcefulness and enough um, persistence and kind of uh, being in the moment enough to do it that it's it's actually hard to do and the hard part is getting to the point well for, first of all you have to know what to do but the, the the hard part is after you know what to do is actually doing it and when that person is choking to actually act in the amount of time that you have because you usually don't have all that much time and I have, fortunately or unfortunately, actually had a couple of experiences where I've had to use my first aid knowledge now. And I can tell you right right now that like the thing that helps the most is the practice and the the looking at the situation and going, okay, I know what to do. I have to do it right now. And so look for situations like that in your life uh, or, or at least possible situations. Going back to you know a couple of minutes here, things that can go wrong where if we practiced what to do about them before they happen, that we can resolve them much quicker. Maybe we can make a list of these sorts of things. Maybe it's worth making a wiki about them. Kind of a preemptive, what to, it's like a, there's a need for something like WikiHow for what to do when things go wrong. Now WikiHow actually does a pretty good job of this in some situations. Uh, but I think that there there could be more resources available and closer to the fingertips. I've heard that for first aid, uh, they're pushing it into a proprietary app where you don't even have to really know anything anymore. You just have to have a phone that has this spyware installed. And then you'll be told basically what to do, similar to the way that the proprietary <laughs> AED machines told you what to do about heart problems when I took first aid. Now. Never mind this, uh, the problems involved with having a, a proprietary unsafe uh, app as being mandatory for all people who have first aid, which is basically uh, everyone with an important job. That That's kind of scary. And I hope that you can get away with just not having that app. Uh, but that that's kind of one worry we could have, right? Uh, what do we do when in order to have a job, you have to have a cell phone? What do you do? when in order to have a job, you have to have not just a cell phone, but some spyware installed on that spy on that phone. Because I think we're getting close to that. There's an article on Slashdog, maybe I'll link to it here, that made the point that in globally, according to their data, 50 out of 53 adults have cell phones right now. now I'm one of the three <laughs> that doesn't, but that's that's insane. That, that is not anything close to what things were like even 10 years ago. And I mean, Canada is starting to kind of fall into the backwaters on this because our cell phone plans are so uniformly terrible compared to the rest of the world. And uh, yes, we've got LTE in places like Saskatchewan and Thunder Bay, uh, but we've also got networks like Bell that the plans are just atrocious. And so, but really, what do we, what can we do? Maybe we're not there yet in terms of having this requirement, but uh, I think we should start thinking about it. And there, it may be something like we need alter, we, like we really need those alternative institutions that provide people uh, meaningful gainful employment, or at least food and shelter. That might be one way of approaching it. But I'm, I'm kind of open for ideas of what else we can do. Because the, the, the spyware and the proprietary software is getting more and more required every year. And yes, we can, we can keep making alternatives to them. Like we can make an open source free software AED machine, for example. But when things like the Red Cross can mandate something like that, it, they, they're probably powerful enough to do it. And so that's that's a political battle that is going to be coming soon, I think. Uh, so something to think about anyway. The third thing I kind of wanted to talk about is, and I can't remember where I found it. I think it was just somewhere on... Uh, somewhere on the Fediverse, and I sort of read it, uh, thought about it for a couple of seconds, kept going, and then like 20 minutes later, I went, hmm, 
I should actually uh, <laughs> refer back to that one, but I long since lost it. It was on the Federated feed. Anyway, they, they made the point that your the, the, there's a certain class of media that tells its audience to freak out. Now, again, <laughs> InfoWars is a great example of this. If you want to see how this works, go to InfoWars, watch them for like an hour, uh, or watch any of Alex Jones's documentaries. I'm sure it'll put you in the right frame of mind to understand where this is coming from. Uh, but the idea that they, they were trying to basically make the point in this this tweet or this toot to not tell your audience is a, is a source of information, journalistic or otherwise, to stress out or to feel angry or to feel stressed. And I think the reason why they, they were doing that is that there's enough things to stress out about and enough things to be angry about. And in pe some people's private lives, they're just like so close to the edge anyway, that just pushing them over that edge, it, it, you don't have to do that. And the reason I bring this up, though, is because last week I did actually say that people should be stressed out. I think I used those exact words in re reference to something I was talking about. And so I, I, I kind of want to get into why I feel that specific case was important or, or should be an exception to this and why generally this is a, actually a good idea. But in this, there are going to be exceptions to it. Now, the reason why I think it was acceptable in that particular case was not because necessarily you should be, as the listener, freaking and stressing out about the particular case of having your rights violated at an airport, but that in the airport, when you're being, when you're having your rights violated, when something bad is happening to you in that instant, in that act, uh, when something is about to happen to you, and you can still react to stop it, or there's a lever that you can pull on that allows you to have some meaningful way of correcting or, or preventing that harm coming to you, in this case, your right to privacy being violated, then there is a, an, a level that such stress can be valid. And what the airport was trying to do was to try to prevent that stress and to hide it under the carpet and to prevent it from being discussed. And I think that when the person who made this tweet or this toot kind of made it, they, they tried to make a point of, especially don't do it if there's no solution available, if there's no way for the person to react, or no cause to support, no way to, to go out and protest or go out and write a letter to their congressman or whatever it is that they need to do. If all you're doing is just like getting them angry and getting them angry and getting them stressed, that's, it's, it's, it's a harsh thing to do to your, to your audience. But in that particular case, in the case of the airport in Vancouver, there is things that you can do. You cannot fly. You can just walk away. You can uh, contact your member of parliament. You can, uh, maybe you can't peacefully protest out in the streets, but you can talk to the people in your life who are flying and say, no, don't, don't go to Las Vegas. Don't go to Thunder Bay by, by plane. There is a train. You can get on the train. The train doesn't involve these kinds of violations of your privacy. To travel internationally, there are boats. There are still ways of travel. They're getting harder and harder with time. Although I, I find the time scale is, is quite long. So things aren't getting worse all that quickly. But there, there is things that you can do, in, both in Vancouver, in the case of that particular airport, and, and generally. There, and maybe I should have been more clear about those things. But it's important to point out when things go wrong that can be prevented. And in that particular case, I think it did actually warrant stress. But it's something it's still something to think about and something to, to be mindful of. Because, you know, so, some people are just really on edge. And it is worth considering or sending them off into the, <laughs> the kind of like a little mental breakdown because of something that they have no control over, which given this is over in media, sometimes you won't have control over. I have no very little control over what happens in Vancouver outside of my voice and what I can convince people who do fly and who could be convinced to contact their member of parliament to do, especially in areas unlike this one, uh, where there's a chance of that member of parliament kind of being defeated in maybe a closer race. Uh, there's that to consider. But anyway, continuing on. Uh, the next thing I kind of want to get into, actually I forgot to get the background music again. 
Let's get a little bit of background music. Is Lauren Southern's documentary. I talked about a documentary last week. Haven't watched it yet. I've, I've got it. I've got a copy, and I'm looking for someone to watch it with. Uh, but this is another documentary, so I've kind of got two documentaries in my queue. Uh, Lauren documentaries, uh, or Lauren Southern's documentary, was removed by YouTube. Uh, twice. It then came back up, so she had a backup copy of it on YouTube, ready to go because she probably knew that this was going to happen. But from her tweet, quote, really heartbreaking when our team has put months and months of work into a project just to have it censored by YouTube. It can't be a coincidence that, or a coincidence that it's not in the notifications, shows it's deleted, not in my videos list, doesn't show in recent history. And, uh, let's see here. So, long story short, it's uh, apparently a documentary about the migrant crisis in Europe and probably a little bit in the States as well and in Canada, but mostly again in Europe, uh, from, from mostly from the breakdown of S Syria and a little bit of Libya, but uh, other things as well. And uh, as I understand the plot, again, I haven't seen it yet, so you have to take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, but it, it, she actually goes and talks to human traffickers, uh, government officials, Everyone who's involved in the crisis on some level, uh, or at least a, a person in a position of authority on both, again, the government side and on the migrant side, wherever she can find it. And to basically give a, a view of the, the human beings and the human suffering on all sides. And so this isn't, at least from my understanding, this, you know, Nazi agitprop video of, oh, the, the black people are invading Europe sort of thing. It's... It, sounds like a honest attempt at portraying a recent event as it actually affects the human beings involved on all sides. Now, maybe I've totally got that wrong. Maybe it is some kind of a Nazi art uh, artifact. Who knows? But you won't be able to tell if YouTube censors you from seeing it and censors other people from seeing it. And so I've got a copy on my website. If you want a copy, Send me a message and I'll I'll give you a link. Uh, but this this is out there and it's it's like it looked pretty well produced, like pretty high quality video. I didn't get very far; I only got in kind of the first couple of seconds. But it seemed like a, a really good effort, at least in making a documentary. And uh, if she's doing real in investigative journalism, then the facts should speak for themselves. And I'm sure she has some uh, her own bias and. There, it's worth talking about that too, but it's it's when this happens, when Google decides what we can and cannot see, that in itself, that's a, that's a dangerous thing, a dangerous path to go down. So I would encourage anyone who's listening to me right now, which I guess zero listeners right now, but go find it, go go download it. Don't just watch it and stream it. Find a actual copy and put it on your computer so that this can't be wiped from history. That no matter what it says, no matter who agrees and disagrees with its contents that at least the copy of the video will survive till the end of certainly the end of the crisis so that historians later on can say oh hey this is what people thought or this is what the you know the extremists or the reactionaries thought or whatever right it wiping out history like this is is, is way too dangerous and so get get that copy of this video seed seed Gratuitously. So continuing on, <laughs> the next thing that was kind of in the past couple of weeks is Prison Planet was banned on Facebook and Instagram, which is interesting because, again, Prison Planet, I mean, it's, it's kind of part of the same sphere of influence as Alex Jones and InfoWars and Zero Hedge. And it, he does get into the, 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 he doesn't hold his punches against the, uh, especially uh, Salafist Muslim migrants coming into the UK and Europe generally. But still, that's not all he does. And there's a lot of stuff that he talks about that he kind of gets re really right, actually, especially re relating to the power of social media and the company and the, the, the uh, willingness and ability of companies who have a monopoly on what people can see and read can and are doing. And so he makes some pretty good points in his I'm banned video about what Facebook uh, has been doing or is capable of, specifically. But he is sometimes worth listening to. And again, so here we have Facebook deciding who can and cannot speak uh, in co concert with other major platforms to 
take someone who is ideologically against them as a general principle and to minimize their voice. Now, I'm sure that they're going to argue that, oh, it's because of his racism or because of his anti-Islam or whatever uh, approach. But it's just as likely that the reason that they're silencing him is because he's one of the main critical voices of Facebook itself. Once we get to that point, it starts to get... And most news is found through Facebook these days, Facebook and Google specifically. It's, it starts to, it, it opens this ability for Facebook and Google to have and express power without the, the press being able to question it and without the press being able to research it. Because, again, they'll start with people like Prison Planet. And uh, I can't, his name is blank, I'm blanking on his name right now, but they're not going to stop there because they've been able to get away with it. And if they've been able to get away with it, they'll go to the next step. So, uh, that was, if, if you've got a, an RSS reader or something like that, what you can do in response to this, this isn't just a, oh, get stressed out and worry about our, our voices being stripped from <laughs> these platforms. No, he still has a website. You can still have a website outside of Facebook. It is possible. Uh, and it's summit.news, S-U-M-M-I-T dot news. And again, take everything you read with a grain of salt. Don't believe all of it, for sure. But it's important that people not be cut off from this guy on a global scale. He had a voice that reached millions of people and then suddenly it's gone. And those connections, those interested people who were interested in his, what he had to say, it's worth considering those connections being severed. Anyway, the next thing is I want to, to reiterate something I've probably mentioned in the past, but I, I want to get to re-describing something that happened a couple months ago which is that Thunder Bay had an election. And as part of that election, for the first time, uh, there was a major push to have online voting or digital voting, both done through phones and through desktop computers. And the polling booths, you had people going up to the polling booths, casting their paper ballot vote. But for everyone who voted that way, there was at least one person who didn't and who used a computer to do so. And I know from, from talking to people in Thunder Bay exactly how much credibility we should put in the computer systems in their life and their ability to stay secure. So many people have never heard of Linux, have never heard of Bitcoin, have no concept of reproducible built systems or anything like that. And so the computers in their lives, they may think that they're doing what they're telling them to do, but they have no idea. Not a clue. And so when we have an election that is decided primarily over 50% of the vote on votes that are tabulated and counted by machines that haven't been audited with votes cast on machines that we have really no idea what they're doing in the background, I would say at this point that the election is in and of itself a farce. And we cannot count on the outcome of that election to have actually taking the will of the voters into account. The chance of that is zero, or very close to zero. And so, given that, given that the election did not actually, or, or we have no reason to believe the election was fair, then a lot of things follow from that. And so, the, the current city council, for example, should we accept them as the current city council? No, we shouldn't. They should resign immediately, or they should have resigned in October, and called for a new election with actual working ballots and machines that can be trusted to the, the best ability that we have the technology to do, i.e. reproducible builds, the source code that can up, stand up to an audit, not just in the voting machines, but in the computers that cast those votes as well for the entire city. And if we can't and, or, or aren't willing to do that, then it should have stayed as a paper ballot system. Now, Maybe there are some situations where individuals, like in, in, in Elections Canada, for example, uh, there, there's all kinds of uh, leeway permitted for people who have serious disabilities. And if that's the only way you can cast a vote, then sure. But most people are able to cast a paper ballot. The vast majority of citizens of Thunder Bay are. And so really there's no excuse for that not to have happened. So, continuing on. 
the uh, so th this is uh, so quote this is from uh, C59 a quote instead of providing the reforms for privacy and accountability that so many of us asked for the bill C59 contains frightening new quote cyber operations powers which would give near limitless uncount or unaccountable power for Canada's spy agencies to do things like influencing foreign elections, suppressing online news, or blocking messaging apps. And that's from Open Media. As I pointed out at the time, their website never works for me, so I can't link to it. <laughs> it's just totally broken all the time, which is unfortunate because the message they spread is super important. They're one of the few groups watching for what the government is doing to address things like C-51 uh, in law. And so if at that time, again, this is a couple of months ago, um, they were gaining the power to block messaging apps. That's something that we should really know that's happening. And it's unfortunate that their website's always broken. But needless to say, the Trudeau government is not fixing C-51. They're talking a good talk. Right? When they were elected, they were talking a good talk about moderating some of the excesses that we've enabled CSIS and CSEC to do and to have access to and the power that they're able and are expressing. But they're not doing that. They're giving them more power. Not only are they giving them more power, but it's totally unaccountable uh, to anybody, including the, the probably the prime minister's office at this point. So we've got the, the PMO, we've got CSIS and CSEC. They can, they can manipulate foreign elections as they see fit. And going back to the kind of the last thing, if they have the power to manipulate any election in the world as they see fit, as long as the technology permits them to, and there there's no accountability of or, or any watching over them to, to make sure that they're doing, or for the public to be able to make sure who is the target, then who do you think is going to be the target? They're going to target us first. They have the technology to do it. They have the will to do it. They have the incentive to do it. Our democracy is totally threatened right now, and it's threatened by the Trudeau government. The most basic parts of our democracy and, and civic life within a democracy, the right to vote, the right to express yourself, the right to have a public protest when the government does something wrong, all of these are under threat. Now, right now, I can still do this broadcast, but where is, where is it going to go from here, right? Uh, if they're able to block any broadcast that actually threatens them by law, <laughs> like... Uh, it's it's worth thinking about anyway what what the consequences of that are and so it is important that we actually replace the Trudeau government with something that will revoke these powers these massive powers we've given to CSIS and CSEC and the Prime Minister's office over the past 15 years but I will kind of leave it at that because we are kind of running out of time but I do have something else to play for you this week which is another clip from uh, Brain Damage this one is from, I can't remember if it was either uh, June 18th or 25th, my Audacity program kind of crashed, of 1988, and it was the week that Jello Biafra had his either album censored or was in the, the press for an attempt at having, um, getting in legal hot water for the artwork in his uh, Dead Kennedys album. So uh, this is just one phone call from that episode. Both episodes are actually really good to, uh, in retrospect. It's, it's kind of the highlight of brain damage almost so far. But I just wanted to end the show with this little phone call because it kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. So hopefully you enjoyed the show. If you did, there is going to be, as usual, uh, you can go and donate via subscriber star villages or Bitcoin to make this show continue and maybe grow in uh, its cap capability to do more interesting things. And if you've got Creative Commons music for me to play, give me a link, uh, send me a message. I'll definitely uh, give it a listen. And uh, if you have any other questions or comments, feel free to add them. And with that, I'll play this clip. Enjoy. That place, I have a book here called Teenager, Someone Does Care by Pastor Fletcher A. Brothers. And it has what, the, what God says about many different topics. And it has what God says about rock music. What God says about rock music? Yes. I love it. Go ahead. This is about rock music. He goes, I know that for many of you, music is your life. I will probably hit a nerve in talking to you about rock music, but I beg you to open up your mind and at least hear me out. Okay. Teenager. Well, Wait, is this God speaking? No, this is, this is bro Brother speaking. He gets to God in a minute. He oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. You, you probably won't believe this, but the number one enemy of your soul in today's world is rock music. Okay. They're not even communism, rock music. 
I hear the rock stars say, we are only giving the young people what they desire. My friend, that is a bold-faced lie. Rock music creates the desires. Rock music feeds the desires. And yet, my friend, when your life is in the gutter, I wonder if any of the rock stars who have advocated the drugs to you, advocated the permissiveness to you, advocated the rebellion to you, which is now spelling the ruin of your life, I wonder if you called any of these rock stars whether they would be at all interested in your problems which they have helped to create. And it goes on. Many rock stars openly claim to be atheists. Others boast of being devil worshippers and so tell of selling themselves to Satan. Some others flaunt their homosexuality, all of which God calls abomination, which means it literally makes God want to vomit. That's a pretty picture. <laughs> what happens when God vomits? That's what <laughs> Then he talks about, um, just look at the results, and he lists tons of rock stars who died. This is the best one. a heck of a large um, After John Belushi, he has John Lennon. He says, John Lennon, ex-Beatle, once said that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus Christ, and yet John Lennon is gone. Uh, what, what, wait, what was that? John Lennon is, is what? Ex-Beatle yeah. once said that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus Christ, and yet John Lennon is gone. What is that supposed to mean? I don't know. I've been pondering that for eight months. Are they saying that, that he got taken from this earth because he said that? That's pretty much it. They make up some bizarre quotes for John Lennon on that cassette. When you receive it, it says that uh, John Lennon says that Jesus Christ was a no-good, stinking, blankety-blank-blank, blank, and he talks about how he cussed him a blue streak. I don't th Which I've been trying to find where he said that, too. I don't think that uh, that was... I called the guy up, brothers up, and I asked him, and he said it was in Billboard. I, I don't know. Then he's got this statistic. I don't think he ever said that. I mean, yeah, even if he did say that, that's, clarified. you know, you can say whatever you want to say, but, I, you know, I, I don't think that's going to get you plucked off the earth. Well, I think the no, like a gunman comes and shoots you because you say bad things about Jesus. Well, they would probably say yeah. the group, the, the, the organization that, that, uh, that says that Lenin is now gone and he said this about uh, Beatles and Jesus, they would probably say that the point they're trying to make is that they say that they're bigger than than Jesus, and yet one of them uh, is is can be killed so easily, whereas um, Jesus has endured over over the all, all the all the centuries. And I don't but, you, Jesus got killed a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, well, I'm, all I'm saying is what, what I think. What I think um, there that that's what they would have in mind if they were asked about it. Um, although you may be right that they may be implying the same thing, they may be implying. Uh, reminds me of a uh, of a joke uh, where somebody walks into a uh, room and sees uh, uh, graffiti on a wall, and the first piece of graffiti says "God is dead," signed Nietzsche, and the next piece of graffiti says "Nietzsche is dead," signed God. <laughs> so maybe that's what they suggest. But seriously, what what uh, I find odd about that, or misinformed about that, is that my recollection is that Lenin clarified that statement about. Sure the popularity where he was simply making a comment about the yeah, yeah, not, number of people who, who, who were interested in the Beatles at a given point in time, uh, who thought of them in a, uh, in a very... Uh, uh, almost religious way. Yes, an, an almost religious way. I don't think he meant that in any kind of no. blasphemous or offensive way to people who are, who are Christian or pe religious people well, in, in of general. Of course, lots of times people are very, they're, they're right there by the gun, you know, waiting, waiting for something to be said, you know, and if you, if you say something that even mentions uh, Christ in it, you're, you're all of a sudden an atheist or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of different groups of people react the same way to that. They're very uppity as, as far as that goes. I personally think it was a very insightful thing for him to say. Uh, I mean, think yeah. about it. The Beatles, the biggest thing at that time, just parallel that to religion. You might, you might get some, some interesting, uh, interesting parallels there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, they had a, a, such a profound effect, not only uh, musically, but for, from a social and political standpoint, that uh, I think that what he was doing in, uh, in a way was complimenting Jesus because he was highlighting Jesus' role as a social reformer as well as, uh, as a figure of religion. Or and perhaps, so he I, was, perhaps he was even warning the, the public, look out, we're getting, we're right, getting maybe too right, big for our own good. Right, I would agree. And they have a whole bunch of Bible quotes about what God says about rock music. I don't think they had rock music when they wrote the New Testament. They say from Corinthians, it says, uh, Wherefore thou ye eat or drink or whatever ye do, do all to the glory of God. His point is that you can't do rock music to the glory of God. He even says that Christian rock is out. 
That's yeah. just as bad because not only is the words evil, not only are the words evil, it's the beat itself. It's the beat is Satan's beat because yeah. uh, Satan has to have everything that God has. It sounds just like the Ayatollah, you know. And what it, he it, says about and then he's got these, mm. he says, "Stop and think, teenager. Three and one half million teenage alcoholics. Two and a half million runaways. He says eighty-seven percent wind up in prostitution. Eighteen percent wind up in wind up dead." Probably, probably because percent of everyone winds up dead. Probably because their 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 parents are too busy quoting Jesus to them yeah. instead of helping them uh, refrain from drinking alcohol and addressing the problems that they're really having. I mean, how is how is quoting the Bible going to help a teenager if he doesn't want to hear it? How is taking away their heavy metal albums going to going to do anything for them except make them want to run away from home? Hey, we're trying to brainwash them. Venereal diseases skyrocketing. Teenagers now one number one in crime. Way to go, teenagers! Right. And millions of lives and minds wasted on drugs and abortions by the millions. Could rock music be fueling this fire? Then he has his plug for his cassette. What's the last rock song that, that you heard that told you to run out and have an abortion? <laughs> I can't think of any. No, me either. Maybe because it promotes the permissiveness. And then he, goes, he talks about how those things in the drugstore aren't protection. You can't have protection against God's laws. Like against contraceptives are like right. evil. Uh huh. I got this article here, it's clipped out it's from the AT, it says Omaha, an issue of National Geographic magazine and some Daffy Duck comic books were among a pile of publications burned by the principal of a religious school who said they were distractions that could hinder Christian lives. The principal, the Reverend Morris Westberg of Omaha Christian School, did not say what was wrong with the publications, which were burned in, a, in front of about 130 students Thursday, but he said, I believe as a Christian school, we have a responsibility to uphold Christian values in every area of life. National Geographic and Daffy Duck? Well, could, could it be that Daffy Duck is a Satanist? Maybe because he doesn't wear clothes. Well, you, you know, you send your kid to a Christian school, and I, I put that word in, in, in double quotes there. Uh, you, you might as well expect things like that to happen. Uh, because that's that's what you're you know what you're doing you know you're sending your kid to uh, to a place that enforces that kind of religion and uh, you know sometimes it's enforced correctly sometimes it's enforced with uh, without any regard to what's what's right or wrong um, of course the kid has no say in this but when this kind of thing starts taking effect in public schools and on, on public radio stations and just in record stores that's when we have to start really taking notice here because uh, that's when our, our rights start getting um, I was a couple months ago, they are having a thing on prayer in school, and there was a whole bunch of praying going on in these schools in Florida, and no one was complaining about it, and they wouldn't do anything about it until there was a complaint with Rosh, and there's so few people, and every time they would try to, they were against it, and every time they would try something like your house would get burned down, uh -huh. or you get tremendously harassed, uh -huh. and it was insane, and there's all these kids saying their prayers in school, it's... I don't know, you close to going down south. It's a pretty different country. Uh huh. Well, well that's, that's that's why uh, it is a pretty different country. And in fact, New York is not a microcosm at all of the rest of the country. Um, but when these things start making their way up here, and uh, we have been been noticing it in this area, we have been uh, been subjected to this kind of kind of thing as far as. Uh, debating whether or not we should be playing these songs and whether they're affecting people's minds and whether they're obscene or not and what's obscene and what's indecent uh when that starts taking a hold you really have to tackle it head on because uh you lose ground a lot faster than you than you think you possibly can i'm, I'm thinking particularly of of the um of an episode of a tv show called wkrp I don't when know. Uh, the jerry falwell esque man is sitting there reading the lyrics to john lennon's imagine exactly uh, he starts off by by advising the station on, on what songs have been proven to uh again in quotes proven to hurt today's youth hurt uh, hurt their minds make them do irrational things and it gets to the point where they're really controlling the station and then one day that the general manager walks in and, and asked if this song should be banned and he reads imagine there's no country it isn't hard to do and reads the lyrics to john lennon's imagine and the person says no this is atheism this is uh this person is, is preaching anarchy and classic lines by gordon jump there at the end that was great when he tells him off i was happy yeah very very good point now now you're banning ideas you're not no longer banning simple words you're banning ideas and that step generally is taken very quickly. That's why I'm so concerned, and I yes. hope other people listening are. Definitely. And if you want to have that say about what's going on in censorship issues, 
language issues, prayer and school issues, there's an entrance fee in this country, and it's called taxes. And there's a whole bunch of churches that should be paying them that aren't audited properly. There's no way of telling how much money they're taking in. Grossly negligent religions. Uh -huh. think, um, well, there's two different kinds of religions. I think there's, there's the real religion where you go and, and you, you see a, a service, uh, preferably in Latin, and you, you, you generally get a feeling for for the situation as it's as it's developed over the centuries. And then there's a kind of mail-order religion that you see on TV with the number on the bottom of the screen telling you to send in your money. The guy has, has 20 Cadillacs in his, in his mansion. Uh, that's religion? It's, uh, the people who should be most upset by, by that kind of religion are the truly religious people of this country because it's giving, it's giving them a bad name. You know, Jerry yeah. Falwell, is that religion? Is, is uh, Jimmy Swaggart, is that religion? Right. It's bad enough that there's these words that we can't say right now because someone will come and throw you in jail. Uh, it makes me feel completely restricted if I have a word that I can feel can express myself perfectly and I'm told, nope, you can't say that. That's like one of the worst feelings I know. Uh -huh. And that's something we should try to get rid of. Uh -huh. Try to get these suckers while they're just starting out. we got to get them now. Thanks for your call, sir. Thank you.